man, as well as all of these that are here, uh, they are looking for healing by some superstitious means. They're not looking to God or Jesus for that matter. They're looking only to the water for their healing. And when you think of what they believed, it's very sad because uh, it, they thought it was some first come, first served basis that they could get their healing, that it had to be that way or they weren't going to get healed. And that's very sad because we know that God desires to pour out his grace on everyone, that his grace is unlimited toward us and that he doesn't choose and and pick like that. So what's interesting about this site of Bethesda is that it's well known, even after the time of Jesus, uh, that it became a pagan shrine. Have you heard of the Greek god Asclepius? Asclepius. Uh, it became a pagan shrine to that Greek god of healing and medicine. Uh, if you've seen uh, the symbol of medicine today, it is the symbol of the snake and the staff, and that is the symbol of Asclepius. Uh, so this place later became a shrine, and some scholars would even suggest uh, that there was a pagan influence to this site going back to the time of the Canaanites. So there was a superstitious element uh, before and even after uh, even for many, many years. And you might think, well, wasn't that out of the norm for Judaism of Jesus' day? Yes, it was. Although there, there were some superstitions you can read in the book of Acts, and some of their thinking was a little bit different than what we know. Uh, but uh, they were not in line with mainstream Judaism to think uh, the way that we're told here. Uh, but it would appear that some of the leaders maybe looked the other way and just kind of let it slide. But nevertheless, Jesus meets this man where he's at. He meets him where he's at. And it's a beautiful thing. Let's continue reading uh, verses 5 through the first part of verse 6. It says, one man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been lying there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? We're not told if he had been sick from birth. Uh, but to be sick for 38 years is a very long time, especially when you consider that the average lifespan for a man at the time of Jesus was not a whole lot over 40. So it's like a lifetime he's sick, very long time. We're not told how long this man has been at this pool, uh, but Jesus, it says here, he knew. He had been there a long time. Now, whether Jesus knew this in the same way that he knew the Samaritan woman had had five husbands or knew that Nathaniel had been under the fig tree with that great supernatural, excuse me, spiritual perception that he had even in his humanity, that perception that he had, or perhaps he had been to this pool before and had seen them there on a prior visit. We don't know, but we know that he knew that he had been there a long time. Let's continue on with uh, verses 6 and 7. He said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is troubled. And while I am going, another steps down before me. This conversation makes me scratch my head. Here this man has been sick for 38 years. And Jesus asks him, Do you want to be healed. Do you want to be healed? And the man doesn't even say yes. Did you notice that? He doesn't say yes. If you're willing, you know, like we've seen before, he, he doesn't. He starts blaming other people for not being healed. He does. Sir, I have no man to put me into the water. He just puts it. It's very sad, really, because he sounds really hopeless and he sounds really negative. And unfortunately, this tends to happen when you lose your hope. You see things negatively. Or have you seen someone maybe who's been sick for a long time and they haven't reached out to Jesus and, and, and trusted in him and trusted in his grace? Sometimes you can lose your perspective and get really negative uh, and start pointing fingers at this or that, and your starting point is from the negative, not from the positive. It's always somebody else's fault. And this man is in despair, and there's even a question if he even wants to be healed anymore. And maybe his identity was so wrapped up with his illness that he's given up his hope. I don't know. But for him, he's confined the possibility of getting healed. For him, his hope of getting healed is confined 
to having someone else put him in that water. And we think about it. He doesn't even realize that the source of living water is standing right in front of him. Remember what he told the Samaritan woman? I'm going to give you living water, and it's going to bubble up within you. And here this man is thinking that the only way he can get healed is to get put in that water, and Jesus is the living water. And so it's amazing uh, the, the imagery that we have here. But, you know, it's like that today too. Uh, oftentimes we can confine God's power to one particular place, thinking that he can only move in one particular way, one certain way, one certain place, and Sometimes we can put God in a box. But all this man needed to do was just reach out to Jesus for his healing. So, uh, and we see Jesus is very compassionate with him. But as his character shows, we see a very passive, at this point, very negative individual. Uh, But I love Jesus' response to him. He doesn't get into a theological debate about his superstitions or his bad attitude. He acts very graciously with compassion on this man. So let's read verses 8 and 9. He says, Jesus said to him, rise, take up your pallet and walk. And the man was healed and up pallet and walked. Instead of getting into a debate, Jesus heals him immediately. It happened. He took up his pallet and walked just like that. This pallet or mat uh, was bedding for those who were impoverished or poor. It was made up of straw and it was very lightweight, uh, making it easy to roll up and for a healthy person to carry it uh, with them. A person who has been sick for 38 years is now whole, and he's walking. And just like we read in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6, the lame are leaping like a deer. And so this is a great cause to rejoice, isn't it? Here you've got somebody who was sick for 38 years, and instantly he can walk. Uh, And so it's a great cause to rejoice, but as we continue reading, not everybody is happy. And so, Dan, please continue with the rest of the story. Let's find out what happens. So again, verse number 9, it says, At once the man was healed, and he took up his pallet, and he walked. Now that day was a what? A Sabbath, or a Shabbat. Verse 10, So the Jews, or Judeans, the Jews who lived in the area, said to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, The man who healed me said to me, Take your pallet and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your pallet and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus, had, uh, afterward, Jesus found him where? In the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse befall you. Says the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews persecuted Jesus, because he did this on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working still, and I am working. This is why the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his own father, making himself equal with God. Wow, what a passage that we have here. Now, this passage really messes with our theology, okay? It really does, because we find this man gets a healing from Jesus and doesn't even know his name, doesn't know who he is or anything. Now, most of the stories that we have, come on, let's be honest, most of the time when we find Jesus going to heal someone, he'll prep them first, and he'll really encourage them to put their faith in him. And when they do, yes, even yes, Lord, help me in my unbelief. And then Jesus will do these great miracles. But in this case, Jesus just speaks this word of healing. And this guy, he doesn't even know who Jesus is. Jesus ducks off into the crowd. So let's find out what the deal is here. What is going on in this passage? Now, again, what's the big controversy here? Jesus, it's not that Jesus heals the man, but it's when Jesus heals the man in what Jesus commands him to do on the Sabbath day. So Jesus heals him on the Sabbath and also commands him to take up his mat and walk on the Sabbath. Now, again, we know that these Sabbath issues uh, come up not only in the Gospel of John, 
but also in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We see Jesus doing various things on the Sabbath, healing and doing some incredible, incredible things. So we know Jesus uh, did, in fact, do some great exploits on this Sabbath day. Now, again, when these Judeans saw this man carrying his bedroll or his mat, even though it's very, very light, they held that he was breaking God's instructions regarding the Sabbath. Now, let's go back. I want to read for you this great commandment. It's the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Anybody heard of the Ten Commandments before? Yep, thought you might have. Well, number four of the ten has something to say about the Sabbath. I want to read it for you because sometimes us today, we today rather as Christians, don't really understand the magnitude and don't really appreciate the Shabbat or the Sabbath like the Jewish people did and still do. So we want to read just several scriptures to kind of feel the weight of what's going on here in our context. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8, if you'd like to turn there you can I'm going to go ahead and start reading pretty quickly but if you're taking notes I know some of you do it's Exodus chapter 20 verse number 8 and following here's what God said to Moses remember the Sabbath day to set it apart as holy for six days you may labor and do all your work but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God on it you shall not do any work you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant, or your cattle, or the resident foreigner who is in your gates. You think all the bases are covered? I think we got all the bases covered here. Verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Okay, again, that was Exodus chapter 20. And then if we were to keep reading in the book of Exodus, if we come to Exodus chapter 31, if you want to write this down, Exodus 31 verse 12. Exodus 31 verse 12, God is going to give some more instructions about the Sabbath. And here's what he says. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, surely you must keep my Sabbaths, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generation. So God's saying, listen, it's not just for you and this generation, Moses. This is going to be a sign that my people are in a special covenant with me throughout all generations. Okay, And then he goes on to say that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You must keep the Sabbath for it is holy for you. And notice in this passage we find judgment will come upon the one who fails to honor the Sabbath. Here's what the Lord said, not Moses, the Lord. He says, everyone who defiles it, the Sabbath must surely be put to death. Indeed, if anyone does any work on it, then that person will be cut off from among his people. Six days work may be done, but on the seventh day, it's a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Anyone who does work on the Sabbath day must surely be put to death. The Israelites must keep the Sabbath by observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual or ongoing covenant. It is a sign between me and the Israelites forever. Everybody say forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So again, the Sabbath was and still is a very big issue within Judaism. Okay? Now, I want to give you one more passage, and I'm going to take the time to read it, and I think you'll see why I'm going to do so in just a matter of moments. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 2. Or 21, rather. Jeremiah 17, 21. Here's where, again, we have a passage that God is speaking to the prophet Jeremiah regarding the people of his day, and it really hones in on the issue that we have going on in John chapter 5. Let me read it, and you'll see how it connects. Verse 21, Jeremiah 17. The Lord says, Be very careful if you value your lives. Anybody value your life out there? Yeah, a couple of you, right? All of us, sure. Do not carry any burden or loads in through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. Do not carry any burdens or loads out of your houses or do any work on the Sabbath day. But observe the Sabbath day as a day set apart to the Lord as I commanded your ancestors. Then if we skip on to verse number 27 of Jeremiah 17, the Lord goes on to say, But you must obey me and set the Sabbath day apart to me. 
You must not carry any burdens or loads in through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. If you disobey, notice, if you disobey, I will set the gates of Jerusalem on fire. It will burn down all the fortified dwellings in Jerusalem and no one will be able to put it out. I mean, that's a pretty heavy passage. The Sabbath was a big issue. It was very, very important for the Jewish people to keep the Sabbath because they believed this scripture. They believed if they disobeyed, if they carried something on the Sabbath, God might send fire and destroy all of Jerusalem. Everybody got, everybody feel the weight of this issue. We're supposed to feel the weight of this issue as we come to chapter 5 because when we read it as we're supposed to, the first part of the story, everything's going great. And then John drops the bomb on us. Oh, by the way, it was a Sabbath. And all of us are supposed to go, whoa, whoa, this is going to cause a problem. And you can see it does, in fact, do that. Now, again, the big debate within Judaism of Jesus' day was, okay, we know we're not supposed to work, but what exactly is work? Okay, because maybe you've got a different idea of work than I do. So the rabbis went back and forth about, well, what exactly is work? Well, originally work was what you did, your employment, we would say, or your profession. What you did on a day-to-day basis, how you earned your livelihood, how you supported your family. But over time, what happened is the rabbis began to classify what work was. And they came up with 39 categories. Everybody say 39. One more time, 39. 39 categories of work. And what they said here was what this man was doing fell under one of these headings of work. We just read it, remember, from Jeremiah chapter uh, 17. You can't carry a load or a burden. So when they saw this guy carrying it, even though it was light as a feather, they said, nope, this guy is breaking a clear command. And so remember, what did they do? They said, what are you doing carrying your mat? And how did the guy respond? You remember? Well, uh, it was the the guy that healed me. We call this passing the buck. Hello? Well, uh, it was the guy that healed me. He's the one who told me to carry my mat. And so the next question is, well, who is this guy? Uh, Don't really know. He slipped away into the crowd. Okay, so again... Here is what we've got. Here's our story. Now, in verse 13, if you look back at it, we've got two pretty striking things. I think you'll agree here in verse number 13. The first uh, striking feature here is we find that the man who was healed didn't even know the identity of Jesus. Okay? The very one who had healed him. That's odd. Okay? Number two, we find the people here, this group of Jews, not all of them would have felt this way, but this group at least, Did they show a real interest in the fact that this guy had been miraculously healed after 38 years? It's almost as if they could care less. Unfortunately, this group is so steeped in their traditions that they overlook the fact that a great miracle has taken place. I'm telling you, stuff like this still goes on in the church today. It happens on a weekly basis. God does something and people are always going to find a problem with what God's doing. <laughs> well, I don't think we should have done it that way. Or I don't th- so while this can be a bit foreign for us reading it, would you all give me just a wave if you agree stuff like this still goes on? Yeah, the spirit of this kind of thing still goes on. Come on, let's have the right attitude. <laughs> okay. Now look at verse number 14. Thankfully... Jesus is not going to leave this man in the condition that he's at. It's not like this man rushes off and says, you know what? (laughs) I think it's probably pretty important that I figure out who exactly healed me. What's interesting, it's not that this guy goes in search of Jesus. Did you catch it? What happens? Jesus goes in search of him. Now, we know it was uh, one of the festal periods. We don't know when it was. We don't, like Michelle said, we don't know which feast it was. But one thing we do know, the population of Jerusalem would have swelled. Thousands of thousands of people would have come in and filled the temple complex. I'm sure it took Jesus a good deal of time to find this guy in the temple. Because the temple complex consisted of 32 acres. 32 acres Jesus had to 
search through to find this guy among the thousands. So let's notice what happens again in verse number 14. What's important here is Jesus seeks this man out. Okay, Now that he's healed, he can actually go into the temple. So that's a good sign because before this, he wouldn't have been permitted to go and worship God in the temple. But now that he's healed, he can do that. So Jesus goes to the temple and finds him. And as we see, Jesus is not just concerned with this guy's physical healing, is he? He's not just concerned with his physical health or his physical condition. Jesus is concerned about something else in this man's life, isn't he? What's he concerned about? We'd say he's concerned about his soul. He's concerned about his spiritual position. He's concerned about his spiritual condition, his spiritual health. So how do we know that? Well, what does Jesus say to him when he finds him? Look at it in verse 14. Jesus charges him, says something to him. What does he say to him? Yeah, sin no more. Sin no more. And it's a, again, it's in the imperative mood in Greek. We have to put an exclamation point behind it. It's not Jesus giving him just a nice little gentle suggestion. I hope you don't sin anymore. Try your best. Do the best you can. Think positive thoughts. No, Jesus says, stop sinning. Stop living a life of sin. Exclamation point. Now, the way I figure it, if Jesus has the authority to heal him, Jesus has the authority to tell this man how to live his life. Yes, he does. He has the right to tell us how to live. And so notice what happens here. We find a similar statement in John chapter 8. Remember, Jesus is going to, he, uh, he's, he's going to uh, stoop down in the ground and, and write. And remember, they brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. They're all ready to stone her in that whole dialogue that we'll eventually get to in chapter number 8. Well, eventually, all the people that are ready to stone her leave and... Jesus says to her, where are your accusers? I have none, Lord. And what does Jesus say to her? Same thing. Go and sin no more. So see, when God touches our life, when we come into contact with Jesus, our life should change. We should probably say our life must change. Again, Jesus heals this man and then expects this man to change. And so, again, we find this great, great principle here. Now, some have suggested, suggested rather that the language that Jesus uses here might indicate that this man's condition, his previous condition, I guess we could say, his paralysis, was directly tied to some personal sin in this guy's life. Okay? Now, listen, we know that sometimes sinful things that we do can lead to illness and sickness. Would you agree? Sometimes we do things to this body that are sinful, and it has an effect on this body. Okay? But not always. Hello? Sometimes we have sickness, sometimes there's disease, and it doesn't mean that sin is to blame. Remember, just in a few chapters from here in John chapter 9, Jesus is going to give another great miracle, and guess what? It takes place on a Sabbath as well. Jesus encounters a man who's been born blind. Remember what the disciples say to Jesus? Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? We still meet people like that today, don't we? People are sick. Mm. If they had more faith, they'd be healed. Mm. They must have sin in their life. That's why sickness is on them. Jesus takes a good deal of time in John chapter 9 to blow that bad theology out of the water. Folks, if that is in your theology, get it out. Sickness is not always tied to personal sin. Jesus himself, not me, it's not me saying, I'm just quoting Jesus here. Jesus makes it very clear in John chapter 9 that the reason that man's condition was what it was is so that the glory of God might be revealed in his life. And God does an incredible work in that man's life through Jesus, doesn't he? Puts clay on his eyes, literally gives him a brand new set of eyes. It's a creative miracle. It's a great story. So again, when we read this passage, let's not immediately think that Jesus is saying, hey, your sin was tied to this illness. But what Jesus does want this man to know is that he needs to leave a lifestyle of sinfulness. Remember, sin simply means to miss the mark. 
to miss the mark that God has for our life. So Jesus says, now you got a healthy body, serve God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind is what Jesus tells him. So again, notice what Jesus says. He goes on to warn him as we work towards the close. Look what Jesus says. He says, stop sinning or what? Or something worse might happen to you. Now we all agree, 38 years of paralysis, that's not good. Are we agreed on that? That's bad. That's horrible. I can't even begin to imagine. But Jesus says if this guy doesn't turn to God and live a life of repentance, a worse fate lay ahead. And folks, again, we've got to always remember that. Okay? That God's priority is first and foremost on our soul and then on our body. Even though the order is a little bit reversed in our story here. Jesus heals the man and then charges him to live right. Okay, But again, Jesus warns him here. Listen, something worse is going to happen if you don't live like God wants you to live. Now notice what happens in verse number 16. We find that this group of Jews, again not all of them, began from this point to persecute Jesus. And it carries the idea that they began to persecute him and they continued to do that. Okay, and this is the story that we have. This is the picture that plays out not only in the Gospel of John, but also in the Synoptic Gospels as well, as well where Jesus faced his most stiff uh, opposition was, again, there in the area of Jerusalem. And it stemmed, according to our text, from this healing that we read about in John chapter number 5.